Yeah, I'm I'm smiling because you know all of this was done by my uh, my other half, my hubby Loon, who is uh, he's got the gift for uh, for design for sure, and uh, we call this we call this little place uh, uh, on our deck Rangoon by the Fraser. <laughs> Ever since we moved here nine years ago, it's been important, especially, you know, with the job I've got at QP. It's nice to have a little oasis at the end of the day. I'd been wanting to write a book about, about Burma, Myanmar for many years, and uh, it was going to be, you know, nonfiction. But uh, there were three different nonfiction ideas I had, which, while I was thinking about them, got picked off by other authors while I was busy working full-time communication. So I eventually decided, oh, I want to do, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to find a way to do fiction and Really, it started with the, the basic premise of uh, an American um, photographer who goes to Burma and gets stuck there. And uh, initially, this was going to be a white American until I realized that, that identity, I wanted identity to figure in somehow. And it began with mistaken identity. And that, just by definition, it couldn't be a white person because, you know, he would stick out. So it became a, a, a Burmese American, like basically a someone of Burmese background who grew up, uh, was raised and thought he was born in, uh, in America. So, but from there, um, the themes of identity uh, really, really stretched out because it, it became a story about um, dealing with various things that we hide from ourselves and from others. And so, for example, there, you know, Double Karma deals with um, uh, ethnic identity, uh, you know, and, and, you know, and the, the West and the East and, uh, you know, Burmese and American and, and, and then also um, religious identity, you know, um, uh, a Buddhist and versus, you know, not so much Christian, but, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, Muslim, uh, Muslim religion factors in later in the story. And, um, and then, of course, once the story gets going, sexual identity and, um, it, and it all, it all kind of factors into Min Lin's story as the, as a photographer who is just going to Burma initially just to find out more about his father's country, his father's homeland, but he gets wrapped up in the pro-democracy uprising and, uh, and he gets stuck there. And the thing I should say to people is this is my first fiction, right? And I mean, a lot of people uh, say, oh, well, you know, there's a process to writing fiction. You should write short stories first. And it's like, well, no, because this is the idea I got. So that's what I should write. And, um, and really, I mean, although I took 10 years and, uh, oh, hello, we've got a hummingbird here. I, I love to have the hummingbird in the shot. That was a great shot. <laughs> it was right next to you. Um, I think that I, I, had some, uh, I had some Burmese readers. I mean, I know, I mean, I met, of course, my source material. I met many Burmese people and talked with many Burmese people over many years about what's going on in the country, as well as my secondary sources and reading all that. Um, and I had some readers of the manuscript um, they're shy about saying, even the people that read the manuscript, even the people who came to my, to my launch and, and spoke, uh, you know, they, they speak kindly about, about my doing the book and, um, and certainly about um, their recollections of 1988, but they don't say too much about the last part. And, um, and I think that's really, that, that's kind of the challenge, you know, it's, it's me saying that. Because really right now, you know, I, I don't know who else is going to say it from the, from the country, you know, in, in quite this way in fiction. I could, I could step out of my fiction role and I could go back into journalism and I could investigate how much of that dialogue is now happening between uh, Muslim groups and the Rohingyas and then the other ethnic groups and, and the Bimara majority, um, Buddhist majority. But, uh, and I've seen little, I've seen some Early on after the coup, I saw some encouraging signs. I'm not sure how widespread that is yet. I actually worked there. So, uh, you know, some of what I'm saying later on is, is informed by what I witnessed while working at a newspaper there. And I was working there for seven months. And in a way, some people might consider that a compromised position that I was in because uh, they did have the, the, the newspaper, as all newspapers there, it wasn't a government one, it was private, independent. But it had the same policy about the Rohingyas as the, uh, as the government and the army. And so in a way, I was doing something uh, that was similar to what my, you know, not in the same scale, of course, uh, as my character who was working directly for the military. And that was a compromised thing. 
So it's not on the same level at all, but it certainly, you know, I had some people looking at me strangely, like, why are you working for that newspaper, right? Instead of one of the international ones, like, you know, or one of the, you know, the, uh, the, the, the international NGOs, right? And, um, and that was interesting. But uh, again, it was seven months. My character worked for the top, worked for the Slork, the evil Slork regime for 16 months <laughs> before he got out. But he did get out. And, uh, you know, that's not a spoiler. That's something that's uh, in the story partway through. I, I was kind of in despair over, um, uh, you know, not having a byline anymore and not being there anymore. And so I thought maybe what I need to do is to, to, to not lose it. Like I had to keep writing because, you know, you, you use it or lose it, right? I had to keep writing, so I thought maybe what I need to do is longer term projects that I can do sort of gradually. Like they're not like deadline things because if I was still a deadline writer while working for QP, I'd go nuts, right? I mean, it's, that, that would not be possible, right? But, you know, really, you know, uh, you know I'm, I've got a, my partner, my husband, Loon, but, uh, you know, I don't have kids, didn't have kids, so had a little bit more space in the day and during holidays and time I could take off to get those projects going. So it was a matter, about, it was a matter of being obsessed about certain things. And, um, you know, the Rice Queen Diaries was pretty much all finished by the time I published it when I was with QP in my first year. Um, but the Pope, the book about Pope Benedict was definitely obsession, an obsession. I uh, was wanting to, uh, to do a, uh, you know, a good old fashioned polemical takedown of this, this Pope um, who had uh, uh, really, really affected the church in profoundly negative ways, a church that I grew up in. And writing that book was a way of kind of purging it from my system. Um, and uh, people afterwards uh, who liked it and thought it was good wanted me to do a, you know, a sequel. Oh, now you'll do a book on, book on Pope Francis? No, 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 I'm done. That, that's good. I mean, I just wanted to do that Pope. Um, and that's, I guess that's partly maybe been a problem for me that I'm not uh, a niche author who writes about the same kind of subjects. I'm harder to pin down. I'm harder to pigeonhole. Um, I'm okay with that, really. I mean, I like taking on projects that interest me no matter what they're about.